With all the foundational work behind us now, we are now going to start looking at Bayes' rule and carrying out some simple analyses to develop intuitions about how uh, Bayes' rule works in practice when doing data analyses. Right? So first of all, let me quickly define Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is just, just follows from the conditional probability definition that I showed you earlier. Right? So suppose you have two discrete events. Right? So these could be events like A could be something like um, the um, streets are wet, you know, and B could be something like uh, it is raining, right? So there could be some discrete events that we are talking about, right? So conditional probability for such discrete events is defined in probability theory in terms of this equation, which I showed you earlier as well, right? Now, this equation says that the conditional probability of A given some particular value of B, right? is equal to the joint probability of A and B. Remember the joint probability mass functions and probability density functions I talked about? That's what we're discussing here, right? Uh, divided by um, the marginal probability of that particular value of B, right? So th in the discrete case, we can compute this easily. And in fact, you can, uh, you can use this for many interesting uh, applications as well. But what I want to show you here is that this conditional probability rule leads to Bayes' rule. It's just, uh, a de you can just derive Bayes' rule from this. So the way we do that is to first of all notice that you can rewrite this equation one in terms of the joint probability. So the joint probability of A and B is going to be this term multiplied with this denominator here, right? So probability of A given B times the probability of B, right? That's a, just a straightforward transformation, you know, of this equation in terms of uh, having probability of A and B on one side and the rest of the terms on the other side. But here's another cool thing, right? So a very interesting observation is that the probability of B and A is the same as the probability of A and B. The joint probabilities are not going to change depending on whether you write A first or B first, right? Because it's, from, it's coming from the same distrib joint distribution. So this is very interesting. Why? Because if I write the joint probability of B and A, then I would expand that using this formula. I would expand that by reversing the A's and B's because instead of A and B, here I've got A and B, I've got B and A here. So I'm going to write the joint probability of B and A is going to be the probability of B given A times the probability of A. But the weird thing is that this term is exactly the same thing as the probability of A and B. And how does that expand? That expands to this term here, the probability of A given B times the probability of B. So what's interesting is you should concentrate your mind on this middle part of this equation here, right? These two terms are equal to each other. And what that means is I can compute, this is the amazing moment in this course actually, I can compute the probability of B given A given all the other information that I have by dividing both sides with the probability of A. So I can get, the, I get this rule, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. This is a clear consequence of this conditional probability rule, right? So it's not controversial and there's no, uh, like nothing to debate here. It's just follows from the conditional probability rule and this is called Bayes' rule, right? And what's really amazing about this rule is that it's going to allow us to carry out very complex data analyses simply using this simple equation three in a continuous setting, okay? So that's what I'm going to discuss in, the, in subsequent lectures. So we can rewrite Bayes' rule in terms of probability distributions now, okay? So right now I was talking only about discrete events, okay? So this was actually discrete outcomes where you can compute probabilities. And you will have seen probably lots of, you know, uh, small toy problems that one sees in probability theory where you can calculate the probability of actually having a disease when you've tested positive for it or something. You know, you might have seen this kind of uh, example in, in previous work. That's, this is the equation that we use for computing that, right? The Bayes rule in the discrete case. But in real life, you know, when we are doing data analysis in general, what happens is that we are working with multivariate distributions, right? We have got lots and lots of parameters and 
we are working with continuous data as well. Right? This is a very common situation. So there, we can rewrite Bayes' rule in terms of probability distributions. Instead of these discrete probabilities here, this is a discrete probability distribution, and uh, this also, right? I can now transform this equation, use this, I'm just, just the same equation, I've just changed the variables, right? So what I've changed here, instead of writing B given A, I've written the probability of theta, well, it's not the probability, it's the density of theta given Y, right? And uh, here I've got the same terms that I had, instead of A and B, I've got Y and theta, right? Okay, so let's unpack this equation and try to understand what this is really saying now, right? So whenever I say F, something, something, I'm referring to a probability density function, okay? I'm not talking about the probability of a single event. You remember this discussion, right? With continuous distributions. Now, the amazing step now, this is a very radical move, is that we are going to assign a probability density function to our parameter, okay? The parameter has a probability density function associated with it. That means that it is a random variable too. This is the radical move compared to what happens in the frequentist world. In the frequentist uh, methodology of data analysis, theta, the parameter theta, in a, for example, in binomial distributions, is going to be an unknown point value. It doesn't have any distribution associated with it. It's just a point value out there, and our job as analysts is to estimate that point value right, from the data that we have. Not so in Bayesian methods. In the Bayesian methodology, the theta parameter is a random variable. It has a PDF associated with it, okay? So that's an idea I will unpack in a few minutes now. The other important thing to look at in this equation is this denominator here. This denominator, f of y, right, what is that? So what is y? y is whatever data we have. For example, it could be reading times, it could be the number of successes in 10 coin tosses and so on. You know, it could be anything, right? So that's what I mean by the data here. So what does f of y mean? But this f of y in this equation here, first of all, look at the left-hand side of this equation. This left-hand side is giving you the probability density function of theta, the parameter theta, given your observed data, right? So it's actually a probability density function. Right? And in order for this right-hand term to be a proper probability density function, you need a normalizing constant. So where is that normalizing constant? That's this guy here. F of y is the normalizing constant that I was discussing earlier in previous lectures. Right? And so what this, this part does is that it makes the left-hand side, the, prob the, the PDF for theta given y, it makes it into a proper probability density function. That means the area on the curve sums up to one. That's what this denominator is doing, right? And the way we compute this denominator is by taking the joint distribution of y and theta, right? This is all abstract, but I'm gonna make this very concrete in a minute, okay? So just, uh, just try to understand the intuition behind this, and then I'm going to explain with a very concrete example how this works, right? So you take the joint distribution of theta and y, and you integrate out the theta. So what does that mean, right? If you remember the conditional probability rule I showed you earlier, for you can write this joint distribution in terms of these these uh, uh, these terms here. I just showed that earlier, right? So I've just rewritten this as in terms of the conditional distribution of y given theta times uh, f of theta, right? So what this gives me is a particular number. It's a constant, right? It's a normalizing constant that changes the uh, the area under the curve such that it sums up to one. Okay. So, but the, this, this integral is very, first of all, it's very scary to look at. And secondly, I mean, maybe we have no idea how to solve this, right? Because we've forgotten how to do integrals or maybe you never learned them in the first place, right? So it doesn't matter because I will show you the intuition using a discrete example, okay? So let's think of a discrete case where we have a random variable, um, uh, that is the parameter theta, right? And this random variable has some discrete values associated with it, right? So you could have a probability parameter in the binomial with discrete possible values like 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9, right? So that's a, that's a discrete case. So you could compute, you could integrate out the theta parameter by multiplying the binomial probability mass function with each of those 
probabilities of each of those thetas, right? So I will now explain this um, in a, with an example. But this process is what we are doing here in this example here, and this is called integrating out a parameter, right? You will hear this term very often in Bayesian analysis, and it's a very obscure term. It's not really clear what it really means, but I'm going to show you now what exactly integrating out a parameter means. And the reason I'm showing this to you is just to show you that this integration can be done, right? At least in simple cases, this integral can be easily computed, right? So let's clarify this with an example, right? What does it mean to integrate out a parameter? What does it mean to do this computation in a discrete case, okay? So think about the case where you have 10 trials, so it's a binomial case, discrete case, with seven successes, right? And then the likelihood function that we have is this binomial function. It's a function of theta, right? That's why I'm calling it a likelihood function. Everything else is fixed now, 10 and seven are fixed. So that's, this function is now a function of theta. And let's suppose that there are only three possible values for theta, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0.9. And each of three, these three possible values has probability one third, right? So the total probability has to sum up to one. That's why I set it at one third here, right? So what I've really done here is something radical. I'm thinking of the parameter theta in the binomial as a random variable. It has a probability mass function. This is a discrete uh, distribution on theta here, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is, I've got the probabilities for each of these three possible outcomes, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.9. I'm just going to implement this rule now, right? I just multiply this likelihood with the probability of each of the possible values of theta, and lo and behold, what I'm gonna get is a summation, okay? A summation of theta one, theta two, theta three with the probabilities multiplied for theta one, theta two, theta three. So let me do the math here. I just do the calculations, right? This is all pretty straightforward, right? And what you get is this number 0 0.058. This is the normalizing constant in this particular case, right? It's the f of y that I showed you in the denominator, you know, in the Bayes rule equation, right? And by the way, cool fact, you can compute this with the d binome function in a single line this is the big advantage of knowing the DPQR family of functions, that you can see the connection between these theoretical ideas and their actual implementation in, in practical terms. So you get the same number here, okay? So this process of integrating out a parameter will give us the denominator on the, in the Bayes rule, and it's a constant, so we can actually forget about it, right? Because we can always work out the constant, as I showed you earlier, and that is why in many textbooks, you will see this formula for Bayesian data analysis where you see a proportionality sign instead of the equal sign, right? So what we've done here is that we've dropped the denominator. Why? Because it's a constant, right? And so I'm talking about the posterior distribution of theta given y being a function of the likelihood and the prior Right? So this I will, of course, unpack in a few minutes. Right, But this is all coming from Bayes' rule, as I showed you earlier. Right, So uh, it's proportional to these terms here. And I just have to multiply two probability density functions or probability mass functions. That's all I have to do now. Right, So what does it mean to multiply two distributions? Right, This seems like a really obscure thing, but I will show you that it actually is surprisingly simple, at least in the simple cases that I'm going to work out right now. But what we get as a result of this calculation is going to be a posterior distribution for theta given y. It may not be a proper distribution because the area under the curve may not sum to one, but we can work that out, right? As I showed you earlier, we can work this out, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a very concrete example where I'm going to take a likelihood, take a prior on the parameter, multiply them, just simple multiplication, and I'm gonna get the posterior for the parameter of interest. And that will be Bayes' rule in action. 